So today we're talking about uh, the Wasso Winter Frolics um, for our History Speaks program. Um, this is a winter sports carnival, um, and it's kind of interesting because it, it has a lot of facets. It's not just, uh, so in, in part, it is a showcase of local winter sports, you know, let people come out and see some, some hockey playing and some curling and snowshoeing and things like that. So it, hand in hand with that is a promotion of the winter sports. It's also, also uh, you know, a big part of this is uh, providing a fun opportunity for people in the community to get together in the middle of the winter and enjoy um, some community events. And then as we'll see, it's also has an interesting combination of sort of boosterism, this attempt to try to, uh, you know, take this community um, and, and put us on the map by having a big carnival here in Wassa. It's a try to attempt to, to promote us and, and make us the, the winter playground of Wisconsin, which is what we were, were aspiring to be, certainly in the late 20s when we get started. And, and over the years, it has changed, obviously. You know, this is a, this is a program that um, started in 1927. Um, and, and as time goes on, it was such a success that they did it again in 28 and 29. You know, and it became an annual event, and obviously it's going to change with the times. The Depression causes a little bit of, you know, the Great Depression in the 1930s, we've got to pull back a little bit in some ways. World War II happens in the 40s, so we're going to put it in the back burner in that case. You know, there, there are situations like that. In the 60s and 70s, there's not as much interest in organized winter sports in the way that it was earlier. So we, we sort of put it on, on hold. But part, hand in hand with that, you know, um, even though there was difficulties in the 30s, we kept bringing it back and finding new ways. Uh, after the 1940s and World War II and the challenges there, they bring it back and find a new way to ex you know, experience the winter frolics for the 50s. And in 1979, surprisingly, we, we decided to, to bring it back once again, a lot, for the, a lot of the same reasons that we did back in the 20s. So it's a long history, it's an interesting history. And obviously in 1980, it's a very different winter frolic than it is in 1930. It's you know, 50 years difference and there's a lot of changes, but at the heart, I think there's a lot of very similarities and that makes it a really interesting story. But we're going to start here with the 1927 Winter Frolics. This is the Frolics that gets everything up and running. Um, and it, it provides a really nice benchmark. So as we go through, I will kind of then use it as an opportunity to, to develop it and show what happened in the 30s and 40s and 50s, and then we'll kind of move forward from there. Uh, but the Winter Frolics in 1927 starts out, it's a week-long event. So um, on January 24th is a Monday. In the afternoon of Monday, they have an you know, opening ceremony, sports through Tuesday through Friday, Saturday, Sunday, um, and then the closing ceremonies on Sunday. Um, so the first day, like I said, there's a parade uh, with lots of elaborate floats and costumes. Um, it was headed by the 128th Infantry Band. Um, you know, lots of other, you know, costumes and all that sort of stuff. It ended up at the Central School. That's where we, we end the, the procession, uh, where they have a bonfire um, on the grounds. And then we have in the, in the auditorium a whole celebration, a whole... Um, uh, ceremonies to open this up. Um, and it starts, um, in, in one of the big things is the crowning of the Frolic Queen. Um, and this is going to be a staple for, for most of the winter frolics going forward. The Frolic Queen um, was, was designed in, in, in the, it's, it's kind of a popularity contest, but in these early years, it's especially sort of a way that we pay for the frolic. Um, so let me, let me step back and say that uh, about a couple weeks earlier before the frolic gets started, after we announced this was happening and what was going to be going on, um, they sent out ballots, nomination ballots. Um, and as you can see, this is what you'd cut out of the Daily Herald, um, and it has 100 votes there. So notably, this is not one person per vote. Um, in fact, uh, you were encouraged to vote early and often. Um, and, and the way that you would do that is by, you know, obviously 100 votes here. Um, if you bought a button, um, so the way that you'd get into the festival and one of the ways that you support it is you'd get a, a button. Um, so I don't know if you can see that. It's probably, well, I don't know if it's backwards. It might be backwards for you, but you get the idea. This is, this is a button. Um, you just, you'd, you'd pin it to the back of your, your coat and that's what got you in all the events. So by buying a button, um, you know, might've gotten you, you know, supporting, they, they would kind of do that. In, in later years, that's going to be the way that the winter Frolic Queen is, is, is specifically crowned. It's just getting the buttons. But here, there's a lot of other ways to do it too. Um, because if you went to local uh, businesses, you know, if you bought a new pair of shoes, every five dollars that or every dollar that you purchased got you 50 free votes, as you can see from here. And then this is actually a really nice breakdown here from the Damon's Music Store. Um, you know, if you bought a brand new piano, you'd get 5,000 votes for the Winter Frolic Queen. 
Now, this is interesting because it does two things. One, it encourages uh, sort of a support of local businesses as part of the Winter Frolic celebration, right? Um, if, if you want to really get your, your, your candidate to get an edge that you want, you want to support, well, you can go buy a piano or a new set of shoes or, or what have you, and that would help, you know, help that process. And also, if you were just looking for a brand new pair of shoes and you didn't know about this, they'd hand you 50 free boats for every dollar that you spent. And so that allowed you to then go, oh, I guess I should check out this Frolic. So it's sort of a cross-promotion thing. Um, but ultimately, it was a really successful thing. They had a couple dozen candidates that got anywhere from, I think the winner had 150,000 votes. Um, and then the, sort of the lower level, there were some people that just got, you know, 110 or something like that. But um, this was the top six going into the final weekend, um, in which actually the, the vote, the vote uh, leaders changed. There's this interesting thing that happens where over the years, there's like little, little, um, you know, uh, strategies that emerge of holding on to votes until the last minute so that you can jump ahead. So there's often sort of changes in leaders. But ultimately, in 1927, the winner goes to Ruth Miller, um, and she becomes the Winter Frolic Queen. And she ends up you know, giving a big speech. Um, that's what opens everything up here. Um, and then they also had some speeches from people like Cici Yaki, Cyrus Yaki, who was the, the president of the Wasa Outdoor Sports Club, which puts on the whole festival. Um, I don't think uh, Fred Weichman gave a speech, but he was the secretary treasurer, and he's really the guy that puts everything together. Um, so I'm going to acknowledge him here. Um, and then they had some community singing. Again, the 128th Infantry Band was here, so they played a little music, um, some community singing, um, a fun time. So that was Monday. Now, Tuesday through Friday had a very similar format. Um, every single day, I mean, there's some differences in terms of what events are happening, but for the most part, they follow the same structure. Um, every day, they open it up with some fireworks from the roof of the Hotel Wassa. Um, so that's at 12.15, so, um, daytime fireworks. Um, then people go back to work and school because it's still a weekday, still have those things. But after that, at four o'clock, people would gather at Recreation Park, which we know today as Athletic Park. Um, and you can see that, you know, it's got the, it's a baseball diamond, right, even back then. Uh, but during the winter, they would flood it and make an ice rink um, and they played hockey. Now, it's worth noting that this particular picture is misleading a little bit. Um, the official photographer of the Winter Frolic was William Assert, which, who took the picture. Um, and this is actually a promotional image that he reused. This is actually taken in 1926, so the year before the Frolic. Um, and so this, this wasn't an actual hockey game that was played as part of the Frolic. There were a couple hockey games that were played at this location, uh, but those would have been like the grade school hockey. So like Franklin School played um, Grant School or something like that. Uh, for the most part, what was happening here was some speed skating events and some figure skating. Um, and they brought in a bunch of figure skaters. Um, and this is going to be one of the big themes for the event. Uh, we have some local talent like Gertrude here, which we'll, we'll talk about her more um, in a bit. Uh, but they also brought in a lot of talent from outside. They, they wanted to kind of jumpstart the winter sports scene here. And we didn't have as much local talent. So they would bring in guys like, you know, Hein Brock here, the clown skater from Minnesota, um, and the Harvester Amateur Club of Minnesota, um, as well as, you know, ski jumpers and hockey teams. And, you know, we'll talk about a little bit more of that later. Um, so that was at from from six to seven or to four, I'm sorry, four to six. At six, or you know, for the next hour, you had a chance to you know maybe get some dinner um, and take the trolley down to the Rothschild area. Um, Rothschild Park would have been where uh, the next chunk of things happened, and obviously the pavilion is still here today. <clears throat> Um, but um, there's a lot more back in the 1920s to this area. It wasn't just the pavilion, it was the park. Um, after the, the dam was put in for the, for the paper mill, it created Lake Wassa, and there's a really nice swimming hole here. Um, there's this little land bridge, um, or I guess a, maybe a peninsula is what you'd call it, didn't connect. But it created a nice little, um, little, little cove for people to go swimming. So there's picnic tables here. Um, there would have been, you know, boats you could rent. Um, this is one of the safe places you can go to swim if you're going to send your, your child out to go swimming uh, on a hot summer day. Um, there are people around. So, it, you know, you, and is that the rush of the current at the Wisconsin River would have had elsewhere. Um, also behind us on the end of the, the sort of land area that kind of stretched out, they had things like um, a slide that went into the water and some fun stuff too. Um, and of course, during the winter, when this all froze over, it was a great place to go ice skating. And so this became the center for the activities during the evening um, and later on the weekends. Um, so you can see here, you know, there's some skaters. Um, I don't know if they're playing hockey or curling or what's going on here. Um, 
but uh, lots, lots of stuff that you have here. So uh, the big stuff that happened at the end of the day from Tuesday through Friday, more or less. Friday had some other interesting things thrown in. We'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, but they would have a hockey game or two. Um, so for the hockey, we had our own local team here. We had the, you know, the WASA um, well, they called it the amateur team. These, these, are, these are maybe adults or young, young adults. Uh, we brought in a bunch of other regional teams, you know, people from uh, Rhinelander, Eagle River. I'm not sure if like Mosinee, I, I can't quite remember all the teams. There's not a whole lot of them, but enough of them to make a little tournament. So it was the amateur bracket. And then they also had the collegiate bracket, which is a little misleading uh, because some of the teams weren't college guys. They were recently graduated college guys, but, you know, close enough. So they had teams from uh, the University of Marquette, the University of Minnesota, and St. John's. Um, and so you also had sort of, sort of two brackets that would happen. So you had the college league and the amateur league. Um, and so Tuesday through Friday, you'd have sort of the, the brackets. And then at the, the end, you'd have the winner of each side play each other in an exhibition match. Um, so that was a lot of fun and, and sort of showcased the, the hockey scene here, which was important. Um, curling is another uh, scene that we have a lot of, you know, people that were already doing it here, but by putting it on, uh, you know, boosting it up so people can see it allows for more people to, to learn about curling, um, since it is kind of a niche thing, um, at least initially. Now, I don't know, this picture is certainly um, from probably from 1928 or 29, because they are in the curling barn, although it's, it's, it's unclear exactly whether they had curling at Lake Wassa is part of the Rothschild Pavilion or whether this was um, actually held here. They just talk about site one and site two and they recently flooded it. I think it was over at Rothschild Pavilion, but, um, and this might be part, partially because this is also a picture, I don't know if it's 27 or 28, um, but I'm not sure. You can see where they have ice skating over here and you can see where the hockey is, but I don't know where they, they would have curling. Um, but anyway, regardless of where, when it was or where it was, um, there was curling that took place and that was a, another kind of thing that was important. Um, at the evening um, of each of these nights, they would be given over to a dance um, and festivities at the pavilion itself, the Rothschild Pavilion. Um, so each day was given over to a specific group that helped to put stuff together. So you have the Eagles Clubs on Tuesday, um, the Elks on Wednesday, the Legion on Thursday, uh, Friday was a smattering of service and fraternal or uh, service clubs. Um, so you had the Lions, the Kiwanis, and the Rotar Rotarians. Um, now I don't know. There's also the Y Y Men's Club, so the YMCA. They don't have a nice circular logo, so uh, we'll put that up there. And then Saturday was Isaac Walton League Day, and Isaac Walton League is a concert, early conservationist group um, that certainly had a very growing number of people that were joining. Although uh, you know by today they're, they're still around today, but they're not quite as big as they were certainly in the the 1920s and 30s. So um, then. That was Tuesday through Friday. Friday, there's some other stuff thrown in there, but the big stuff was the weekend. People didn't have to go to school or work, and so we had some longer form events, and it was really jam-packed with things. So you had some uh, cross-country skiing um, and, and, and snowshoeing, and these were races that people went out for. They had um, everything from, from two mile to, I think, 10 or 12 mile races, depending on how old you were, you know, what bracket you were in, or, or gender. Girls and boys had separate things. Um, there's even one race, a four mile race between, and I don't know if it was just a mixed thing or whether they had like literally cross country skiers versus snowshoers, but um, that was a thing that they did. Um, then you also had throughout this period, Friday through Saturday, you had things like um, exhibitions of, of gun, guns. So you had the rifle, uh, uh, an exhibition of rifles uh, from the St. John Military Ac uh, Academy of Cadets of Delfield, Wisconsin. They brought, again, bringing up some talent. Um, and they also had some trap shooting and skeet shooting, you know, clay pigeons and things like that. Um, there was a dog sled race. Uh, Dave, uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, Dan Story, uh, who was a, a, a big guy here, an ad guy. He had some uh, work for Employers Mutual and things like that, um, as well as I think running his own company for a while. Uh, but he, he was a big proponent of dog sleds. And so he ends up um, having a, a junior dog sled competition. This is the second annual one of those. And then they, after this going forward, it's going to just be part of the winter frolics, at least for a few years. Um, there's some interesting stuff like girls hockey. Um, they, we actually had two girls hockey teams that played here in 1927. There was the, the Red Robins and the White Girds. Um, so they played hockey and basketball on ice skates, which I think is, is partially sort of a novelty thing. Um, but 
you know, there's that. Um, there's a lot of other novelty stuff they had. And, and this footage is from like the mid thirties, but they had barrel jumping um, and things like that on ice skates, just kind of fun challenges to see who could do, do stuff. They had like ice bicycle races, which initially I thought meant bicycles on ice. Wouldn't that be kind of a slapstick fun thing to do? But no, it actually turns out that they had special bicycles that were built with ice skates on the front wheel and the back wheel would, they'd take the rubber off and they'd like make like a, a jagged uh, like saw thing that would like dig into the ice. Um, they had a, a horse race, like a harness horse race um, on the ice. They had uh, what they called horseshoe pitching, which I think means horseshoe games. You know, all sorts of just kind of, um, just kind of interesting stuff here. Let me see if there's any others. Um, oh, here's a fun one. Um, ski racing behind a motorcycle was something they tried there. Um, they had something called chariot races for the grade school kids, which meant that you had two boys skating and pulling a girl behind them, and that was the chariot. So they had a 440-yard race on that there. Um, so yeah, a lot of kind of interesting little things here and there. And this is going to be kind of setting the stage going forward, too. You have the big stuff. You've got the hockey and the, and the curling and, the, and you know, that sort of stuff. Uh, but you also have, uh, for example, um, oh, Started that again. There we go. Um, and in 1928, they brought in the Ashland Girls Hiking Club, which is kind of crazy to me. I don't really understand the excitement, but they were really pumped about this. Um, and I think part of it is hiking is a new concept in 1927 and 28. Um, in, on Sunday, by the way, uh, the theme was uh, for the morning, everybody should go to church. Uh, but they said, everybody go to church and hike there. Uh, it's kind of hard to think of hiking being a re new recreational thing, but it kind of was. So there's stuff like that. Um, and the last one that I'm just going to point out of many examples um, in 1928, 29, and in the early 30s, um, uh, Carl Eliason of Saner, Wisconsin, brought his uh, prototype snowmobile. Um, so this wasn't a race or anything. This was just more of a novelty come, you know, um, get a ride on it, just marvel at how fast it could go over the snow. But the big event, um, or one of the big events, the big novelty events, was certainly ski jumping. Um, ski jumping is one of those things that people probably didn't know very much of. Like hockey and curling was out there, right? Ski jumping is something you need to ski jump for. And so the chronology here, I, I, I would imagine in 1924, the first Winter Olympics are held in France. It's the first time we have a Winter Olympic Games. And so I think just like today, if you, if you end up you know, watching the Olympic Games, um, you'll find yourself getting oddly interested in, you know, some sport that you've never heard of or never thought about. Um, same thing here. They, they can't watch the events, but they can read accounts of ski jumping. People, you know, ski jumping basically is you go up on top of a, uh, a scaffolding like this. Um, you put your skis on. This is all packed with snow and you slide down as fast as you could. At the bottom, there's a lip just before the, the crest of the hill. And, and then you try to fly as far as you could um, until gravity pulled you down inevitably. And when you came down, hopefully you weren't, you know, you had your skis in the right way so that you didn't tumble and, you know, fall and maybe break something. Um, and just reading about that was really exciting. But now in 1926, so about a year before the frolics get started, the Wisconsin Valley Electric Company, which owns the whole pavilion and park in Rothschild, they build this. And so now people can come out and see it for themselves. Um, and as cool as that is, it's even cooler to see you know, international talent that came and actually took part during these years to actually see people who were really good at this. Um, and to the point where like, this is, becomes very iconic. Like this, this image is very common of the, um, the ski jumping clown. That's like the, the mascot of the winter frolics. Um, and for good reason, people really enjoyed seeing it. So this is a view from the top looking out onto Lake Wassa. Um, so you can see the, the, you know, the, the down onto the lake. Um, this is when they were actually ski jumping. Um, so you can actually see it's a lot of people that are, are gathered here to watch this happen. Now, I do have to point out, though, as I was looking at this image, I was kind of concerned what's going on over here on the right, right over here. Because these people, what, what are they doing over there? Um, and it just kind of looked off. And then I realized that they actually match up with the people. Over. So whoever, to, uh, Lassert or whoever was in charge of this decided to cut out 
uh, some of the people and then make it look like there were more people by by adding even in 1927 we're doing you know photoshopping to making it look like crowds bigger than they are I guess um, and I don't know maybe maybe that was a genuine attempt to try to reflect that there were people over there it just wasn't shown um, or maybe he just thought it would be kind of a you know I can do it so why not because people won't won't be as concerned about it because it's a new thing um, I don't know but you can even see you know the the, the cut out around them where the paper would have been um, Kind of interesting just to kind of see that. Now this actual picture is from the, fr the front cover, the ver very first thing when you open up the, I actually have a copy here, the, the souvenir book. So this has, um, this has, you know, so you can see the, the first picture here, there you go. This is, this is just kind of, here's what you have. And, and, and I want to talk a bit about the other aspect of the winter frolic. It's, it's fun, it's a great way to show off these winter sports. But you also have, um, and I think it, the, the boosterism is on full display. Um, so boosterism is a philosophy um, that is, is maybe best crystallized and shown in the winter frolics of the 20s. Um, you see this, this phrase here, it pays to play, um, that's on the cup. This is kind of the unofficial slogan of the winter frolics. And it's actually a play on words of something that you'd see in the newspaper a lot, which is it pays to trade at Wausau. Um, so... Whenever they would get in the newspaper, you'd get down to an end of a column and there wasn't enough room to actually start a new article. They would just kind of have a couple lines. And so they would, you know, you often see some witty statement or a joke or a Bible verse or something like that. Uh, but often the Daily Herald and, you know, editors just like to put in this phrase, it pays to trade at Wasa, which is part of this boosterism philosophy that's going on. Um, so boosterism is... You know, a very similar thing, you know, the work for WASA, that's the official slogan of WASA that gets created by the chamber or the, the booster club, which is the precursor to the chamber of commerce. Um, and they put it up on the city, city hall, right? These phrases are part of boosterism. And boosterism is my idea that there's this civic responsibility for every individual of a city. Um, if you live in WASA, it's your responsibility as a citizen to promote Wasa. It's not just being proud of where you come from. It's letting everybody know when you, when you go on vacation, when you're traveling for business, you better let people know that you're from Wasa and you're proud of it and just spread the word. Um, you know, in retrospect, I mean, if you look at like it pays to trade, that might seem like it's an idea of trying to promote local businesses, right? It's kind of like uh, made in America or, you know, buy local, right? But if you think about it, in the 1920s, people don't, like, there's no alternative. If I'm going to go, you know, buy a new, sp new pair of shoes, I'm not going to go to Walmart and buy something built, you know, made in China. Um, I'm not going to go on the internet and just have something delivered to me. I'm, I have to go. You know, I'm not going to get on, go on a train and, uh, you know, catch the train down to Stevens Point, buy some shoes or groceries or whatever, and then come back to, no, you're going to buy local anyway. And so uh, a lot of what this is doing is it's not saying, you know, it's, it's, it's a call to action, but it's not really about the call to action to trade in WASA or to work for WASA. It's about showing that we're all in this together. You know, the, the, the ads lead up to the Worcester Frolic, it all depends on you. We need to make this a success because if it's a success, then we're gonna be, everybody's gonna be good. Um, you can see this kind of sentiment here. This is the, the annual WASA uh, Daily Herald edition leading up to the second frolic. And you open it up and it has all of these articles about what's gonna happen. But obviously a lot of it's given over to advertisers. And you can see the same sort of stuff. Everybody's kind of showing that they're invested in the success of the frolic. And they're using it pays to play and work for WASA. This is about showing, it's not about convincing people that you should do this, it's about showing that you're doing your part and you know, hey, if it doesn't work, it's not my fault, it's your fault for not showing up, um, which is kind of an interesting philosophy. I mean, you don't think of like, today, if, if someone from the WASA area events you know, goes on the radio or, or does an interview on TV, they don't, they don't say, hey, we need to make the hot air balloon festival a success. Everybody needs to come out. Otherwise, it's your fault if that WASA is not going to be left behind. Like, they don't say that. They say, hey, it's going to be a fun time, you know, and, and you can see that evolution to that sort of selling of these ideas in the course of the Winter Frolics, which is really interesting to see. 
Um, and, and finally, just to bring us back, um, you know, Ruth Miller, Queen, her speech in 1927, you know, that opening festival, it's even shown here. Because in, aside from saying, I hope I'm going to do a good job and I'm going to, you know, represent the, the office or the, 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 the position well as the first winter frolic queen, she says that in addition to being a fun thing for Wassa, um, the festival is, the, uh, the city will gain much through the great amount of advertising the frolic has received in this and nearby states. The frolic is a good community proposition and should be held each year. And we are, we do get, uh, uh, you know, coverage in the newspapers for in Wisconsin and beyond. I don't know how they picked us up in Tampa, uh, uh, but they do. Uh, I, I have to imagine that was maybe just put out on the wire. They just needed something. But um, yeah, people are talking about us in, in, in Tampa, Florida, which is, is, is a bit of a change. Now, it's worth noting here that even though WASA is going to really epitomize this and really like maybe be the most, you know, brightest example of the winter frolic, we don't own it. It's not something we created. In fact, you know, this article here, this ran in the Daily Herald a couple months before we announced the winter frolic in 1926. And it's showing Edna Johnson uh, being chosen and being crowned as the uh, Duluth winter frolic queen. Uh, we had a, a midwinter frolic by the, the normal school in 1927 uh, and 26. Um, it, you know, sort of the winter frolic is sort of a prom celebration, but you also have sports festivals. Oshkosh has one in 1927. So does Madison in conjunction with the university. There's one in Green Bay. They're looking at doing one in Rhinelander and Antigo. Um, not necessarily in the 20s, but in the 30s, you're going to see other communities like, like Marshfield, which has a very, very successful, long-running winter frolic. So it's not something that we own, but we own it. We, we make it our own, um, and Wassa really you know, becomes a part of the, the tradition, the annual tradition here. So, I mean, you know, and we do have it every year. Even from the beginning, it was intended to be a regular event. It's not just something that we're going to do as a one-off thing. We're going to hold this going forward. And so um, I should mention all the clown, ski jumping clowns, um, Ted Mayer uh, of Mayer Shoes, um, uh, he, he is the guy who does a lot of the art for this. So if you see, anytime you see a, a early winter, um, winter frolic crown or a lot of the artwork like this is, is Ted Mayer. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're, it's getting bigger and better. We're just going to keep adding to it. And, and yeah. Now, I think at this point, we've talked a little bit about the sort of philosophy of the frolic and, and, and institutional. Let's put a pin in that and see how winter sports, because the other big thing, in addition to boosting for WASA, it wants to we want to promote our winter sports. We want to get to a point where we don't have to bring in talent from Minnesota and Madison and, you know, wherever, right? Um, and to an extent, this is very, very successful. Um, ski jumping is a great example of this. We go from, you know, bringing in ski jumpers to, in 1929, uh, there's enough support that the ski club creates this, the, the Waski Toe Jump, or as it's mostly known, um, the Stark Street Jump. Um, so this is in Wassa proper, um, and this is, this is a, a big ski jump. It, it ends up becoming its own big thing. Um, and throughout the 1930s, we hold competitions here. People are coming to Wassa. And, and this is one of the big, you know, center points in the 30s of the frolic is, you know, it's not the ski jump at Rothschild, which did its job, but now we have a bigger and better jump to, to use. Um, now, I won't get too deep into this. There's a lot of ski jumps over the years in different places. Um, one place that is a, sometimes said that there is a ski jump, but I just want to clear up, there is never a ski jump on Rib Mountain. But Rib Mountain does come to its own as well in the 1930s, right? Um, so a little chronology here. Um, the state park gets put in in 1930. So we start developing it there. It's not really until 1936, though, that we see skiing become a big thing. And, and a, a big part of this is because the Civilian Conservation Corps is established with a camp here. And the CCC is one of those New Deal, you know, Rooseveltian um, sort of programs that's designed to put young men back to work. Um, and that's going to be building roads and digging ditches and planting trees, but also building buildings like the chalet at the, um, the, the Rib Mountain uh, Ski Hill um, and developing parks like the Rib Mountain State Park, like the ski runs, uh, like the Dells at the Eau Claire. Um, they get started on the big, uh, uh, big old plain park. Um, and that's going to be really helpful at jumpstarting this. And over the course of the late 30s and 40s, we are going to really see downhill skiing become a really important part of this. Um, to the point where in 1937, they actually introduce downhill skiing as part of the winter frolics, which is interesting because just like, you know, if you think about the, the newness of hiking as a thing or the, the ski jumping in the early 20s, in the mid 20s, 
you know, they have to publish this article saying, you know, here's what slalom skiing is, uh, because nobody, you know, you might not know about it justifiably. Um, and I love, I love here where they have a con the correct pronunciation, where they say, um, now for the word and its pronunciation, call it slalom with the accent on the first syllable, and you will be right. Slalom is also an acceptable variant, is uh, used by many skiers in the East. So yeah, here's what this is. Um, and, and, and it's interesting because downhill skiing has this element. You can compete in slalom or down, you know, speed, you could, you know, but you don't have to go fast. You can, you can just go and, you know, hit the bunny hill and go with a bunch of friends and just enjoy yourself. You can go at a leisurely pace. You can go down once, go, it's not for me and enjoy the, the, the comforts of the chalet for the afternoon. Um, it's called all, all on your, your own. Um, we still don't have to go fast, but other sports, increasingly are trying to go faster, like the Wasa Speed Skating Club, which gets established in 1934. Now, there had been speed skating, like I said, in those early years of the frolics in 1927. And I think that is, I think, I don't know how organized speed skating was as a thing at that point. I think it was largely just, hey, kids, come on down, put on your skates and see who can skate the fastest. Um, uh, you know, it was, you know, they had prizes certainly, but it wasn't really like designed to promote the sport. Whereas now in 34, this is a group that is definitely promoting the sport. Um, so here is some, some footage again from the mid thirties of some of these competitions. Um, and I'm gonna take a moment to, to note. Uh, so this footage is actually eight millimeter film that was digitized. Um, and I want to thank Jerry and Barb uh, of, of uh, let's see, uh, New Berlin. Um, there, uh, well, Barb's um, uncle, I think uh, was was the Zier's. Um, so Earl and Connie Zier were big outdoor enthusiasts and and the enthusiasts of uh, uh, thankfully for us uh, early um, uh, video. Um, so they had a video camera and they they it's really some remarkable footage. So a big thanks to them for for letting us us use this. Um, so as you can see, uh, not just uh, speed skating but also you know entertaining people. There's some sort of you know hijinks that they get up to. Um, as well, which is pretty kind of cool to see. Now, and it kind of leads us to the other aspect, which is figure skating. Um, and for that, I want to talk about Gertrude Papkala. So we mentioned her and showed her the bird on ice earlier, uh, but she's actually one of the really important to the early festivals uh, uh, of relics. So in 1927, here she is in front of the uh, Wisconsin Valley Electric Company's float. She was an employee there and they basically told her, um, you know, she wanted to get involved. They, they put her in a big, you know, she's on the right here um, in this red uh, jacket. Uh, they said, go out and sell buttons so that she put her to work doing that. But she was also a really talented ice skater. Um, and in fact, in the 1927 frolic, the very first year, uh, she was named the best sportswoman present. Um, and so she was given the Schofield Cup for that. Um, and as time goes on, she and her, her skating partner, uh, Herman uh, Reckler, are going to be really important in the figure skating. Um, so they, they form, again, in the early 30s, the figure skating club. Um, so this is a little bit of them, um, as well as uh, the rest of this figure skating club, uh, which are doing sort of a nice pinwheel group movement uh, sort of thing. Um, yeah, and they, and they skate not just here in, in, in Wausau as part of the Frolic, but all over the Midwest uh, competing. They won a couple of the, the trophies here, but also, you know, competed elsewhere. Um, and I think this is important um, for a couple things. Uh, one, it shows that we have some local talent, right? It's not just people from Minnesota and Marquette and, you know, that we're bringing in. Um, even in 1927, there is some, some local talent that we can be proud of. Oh, um, this is Mr. Zier, by the way. Uh, so... Thanks to, to him and the family for, for, for taking the footage. Um, yeah. Also, I want to mention here, you can see, obviously, if you're familiar, this is, this is Marathon Park. So um, in addition to moving the ski jumping to, to Wasquito Hill in the 30s, we are now, there's a nice ice rink um, where a lot of the stuff happens, the hockey um, and the ice skating, uh, both speed and um, uh, figure skating at Marathon Park. Um, so there's, there's Gertrude. Um, now, in addition to this, over the course of the 30s, you see the rise of another form of skating and sort of the, the figure skating in a different form. Instead of sort of competitions like this um, that they took part in, um, there were things like this. So this is, this is some footage from the festivities at the Wassa Centennial, which was in 1939. Um, so the 100th anniversary of the settling of what was going to become Wassa, they have a whole big year-long event. 
um, starting with the Frolic in 1939. Um, and, and as you can see, this is sort of a masquerade ball. They do a whole pageant, costume changes and music numbers. It's sort of a big part of the festivities. Um, and, and this is in part uh, another change that you're gonna see. You're gonna see more of a performative aspect and you know, coming out to the Frolic and similar things for these, these ice carnivals, these, these shows, as opposed to just seeing you know, competitive sports. Um, yeah. Uh, take the moment here to also mention this particular footage is actually, I believe, taken either taken by or, or in, you know, we have it through um, Bob Geisel, uh, who was a, a, you know, a, a big, big guy in that time period. Um, and and his, his protege, Bob Becker, um, actually had the film and, and digitized. So thanks to them as, as well for, for taking that footage. Um, and of course, you have the, the Queens. Um, Speaking of queens, let's let's talk about them because I think you know as far as the winter sports go, you can see that there's a, a big success. We you know promoting winter sports leads to bigger of better events. You have all these clubs being formed, but the frolic itself goes through some changes and not always for the better. And I think you see this very clearly in the frolics. Um, this is 1928 that put it here. Uh, so it's not just a here somebody's you know uh, Ruth Miller's crown. She's going to give a speech. Increasingly in 28, 29, there's a big pageantry involved, costumes. There's a whole festivities. Um, in 1929, Grace Prawl becomes the first or uh, the next queen, um, and she's also uh, sort of honorary. There's a, a the first. Um, Winter Frolic King, which is Major John Wood, who is an aviator um, that they honored with this. But in 1930, we don't have a queen. And part of this is the, the sort of excitement around the Frolic kind of fades and the depression's kind of hitting. And so some of the extravagant stuff that we've been doing in the past, you know, we're, we can't afford to do that. So they pull back on that. And as I said at the beginning, right, the, the Winter Frolic Queen is designed to sell. And if people aren't, aren't buying things, so we don't need the extra money that it brings in selling you know, buttons and, and, and stuff like that, then we don't really need a queen. That was the, the justification at that time. Since we're cutting back, we don't need to worry about the queen. That's just an extra expense. So we can just focus on what we're doing. Um, unfortunately, this did not necessarily help. And in 1931, there is no winter frolic. It just, we can't put it on. Now it comes back again in 1932. And, and, and this, at this point, when they bring it back, people say, hey, what about that queen competition? <laughs> like from an administrative point of view, it makes sense to get rid of it, but people like the Winter Frolic Queen. And so um, they decided to bring it back, um, another slate of candidates. This time though, you couldn't buy a piano to get extra votes or, or shoes or whatever. Uh, it was just one person, one vote. Um, and so the winner here is uh, Valerita Erdman. Um, but again, even here in 1932, it's successful, but in 1933, we don't have a frolic. So we're still in the middle of the depression and we need some help pull, getting pulled out of this. And this is when the booster club, uh, the, the, or basically the precursor to the, um, the Chamber of Commerce uh, sort of group, they step in and they put um, uh, Robert Dudley in charge. And D Dudley is, um, he is the chairman, they often called him. He's the guy you want, uh, you, you need somebody to head the, the promotional events to get the, um, you know, the, the, the new municipal pool funded by the public. You put him in charge, he's gonna make it happen. Uh, he gets involved in a big way in the Lumberjacks baseball team and the Samoset Council Boy Scout troops. He is the umpire for like baseball for many years for like Little League and things like that. Um, yeah, and so in 1934, he gets put, cha becomes chairman of the Frolic. And so for the next two years, he's gonna oversee this and really kind of bring it back. Uh, but the way that he does this is again, kind of going back to the 30s. He says, let's get rid of the frills. Let's make it about the, the competitions. Let's get rid of, you know, we're not gonna have a big parade with lots of floats and, you know, sponsorships and things like that. I mean, we are gonna have a parade because Robert Dudley loves himself a parade. So we do have a parade but it's just gonna be people, it's gonna be a, it's just sort of a community grassroots event. Um, and then we can kind of, once they stabilize, um, then they bring back the Winter Frolic Queens. Um, and notably in 38, um, there's a shift to the, the booster, count, uh, 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 booster Club ends up kind of giving over to control to a specific citizen group, a civil group that kind of runs it. Um, and so they like for 1938, they kind of experiment with maybe not having a official queen, but it's sort of a pre-dance uh, thing, um, but yeah. Oh, shoot, I never fixed this. And this should say, obviously, 39 and 40. Whoops. But by 1940, uh, in the 40s, we have another complication, which is the World War II. And so that gets put on the back burner. The, the frolic is a big undertaking. It takes a lot of work to organize and to keep running. 
Um, so what we do is we kind of put it on the back burner. We don't have it during that. And, and eventually we kind of bring it back. But in the meantime, you know, Marshfield is, is a very strong winter frolic. Um, and actually Mosini does as well. Um, Mosini, which I, I don't talk very much about because just of the nature of this, but Mosini is another powerhouse of the winter sports scene in Marathon County. Um, and they have, a, you know, especially centered around in the late 40s, um, in the late 40s, centered around the ice carnival that they have, which is like figure skating, sort of, again, kind of the show thing. Um, they put on a winter frolic too. And that winter frolic includes some, uh, a hockey game and some curling and the crowning of a winter frolic queen. Um, so it's, again, Wasa doesn't own the winter frolic. Um, and in some ways, uh, people kind of forget that we even come back after World War II, but we do. Um, there is a winter frolic queen crowned at least 1949 and 50. And the fact that I'm not entirely sure about what's going on should tell you that it was not particularly well publicized or a big event, but that's going to change when in 1951, after the kind of lackluster return in 1951, uh, they bring in the Junior Chamber of Commerce. Now, the Junior Chamber, or the JCs as they're known, um, I'm not sure exactly when they get started. Um, I, I think back in the 30s at least. Um, and, and basically, this is a group that's supposed to be a sort of training outfit for the Chamber of Commerce. Um, this is the men who are 18 to 40 years old. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce is the group that does the, you know, they're the boosters, right? They're going out there getting the name out there. They're putting, you know, publicity and trying to get businesses to relocate here. The Junior Chamber, the JCs, they kind of figure, um, you know, this is an opportunity for, for these guys to network, to um, show and develop their leadership skills in, in putting events on. And maybe the biggest one that you're probably aware of is the 4th of July celebration at the uh, Marathon Park, uh, which is still being held, although the JCs themselves, as I understand it, are not uh, still around in the same way, but the committee got spun off and they still do this. But they do a lot of other events. Um, and again, kind of focused on not necessarily doing something so that it gets in the papers all over the country, but just to put on a good, fun thing for the community. Um, and so that's what they do. In 1952, they, they sponsored this. And in, in the 1952 to 53, and during the summer, uh, or sort of non-winter months, uh, they put together, um, you know, reach out and bring in members of the ski club, the hockey club, speed skating, figure skating, and curling. Um, and they create the Wassa Winter Sports Council, which kind of has two goals, uh, or two major goals. One is to promote these winter sports by creating programs and getting funding to support teaching curling and speed skating, et cetera, to younger kids in elementary school through high school. And the second thing they do is make sure and, and work together to make the frolics a success. And the frolics then also transforms into a showcase for these winter sports. For, you know, they have adult events and other stuff too, but at the core, it's about showcasing, it, it kind of like how 4-H kind of takes over the fair, right? The, the county fair, it becomes a showcase for, for the 4-H club. Um, and a lot of the reason we have the fair is to support 4-H, right? Uh, similar thing here, um, except, except, you know, for winter sports. Um, and, and the proceeds of the winter frolics then go back to these programs to help the sports. And so we have a big rejuvenation of winter. You know, this, this brings a new energy and a new sort of direction with, by bringing in the JCs. And so we have the return of ski jumping, uh, figure skating, curling, hockey, and speed skating, downhill skiing too. Um, and then there's broom ball, which I haven't talked about because it's kind of hard, but I mean, back in 1928, or 27, the first frolic, they had broom ball. And, and actually, uh, you know, low key, the broom ball is one of the big events that has held throughout this era, um, even up into like the 80s and 90s. I mean, today, broom ball is still around. It's not as prestigious. Um, so, so for example, here is, again, some, some great footage from the 30s. Um, this is about the only footage or, or actually pictures I can find from this era, era of broom ball. Um, Ooh, let's see. So, so it, it actually is a little misleading because they're on skates, which they shouldn't technically be doing. Um, they should just be without skates. That's what broom ball is. But it's basically hockey, uh, more or less, uh, except instead of sticks, they're having brooms. Instead of a puck, you got balls. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a longstanding tradition of, of having this. Um, again, uh, no, not a lot of pictures. People don't necessarily document. It's maybe not as prestigious as hockey, um, but it's a long running and, and a big tradition in winter sports here. Um, also, we have the return of the a queen, of course. Now, this is interesting in that um, in the 30s, they had gotten rid of the whole, um, you know, the winner of, it was just a straight popularity contest for the queen. Uh, but in 1950s, they bring back the 
the winner sells more buttons. Um, so I have an example here. Uh, again, along with the, the parade and, and the masquerade balls and stuff like that. Um, again, I don't know if this is backwards for you, but um, this is actually a, a 1956. Um, it's sort of an aluminum cutout, but uh, you sell the most of these, um, you get credit, and then that's how we crown the Winter Frolic Queen. Uh, uh, the, the, the winner here, by the way, um, is Janet Dopke, I think, her, is that how you pronounce that? Um, anyway, so here we have this very successful, you know, running thing. And of course, it changes over the years. But at the heart of this, you can tell, you know, help us help your kids. This is not about promoting WASA or getting businesses or, you know, whatever. It's about helping us help your kids. And this is great until it isn't. And, and this is something that I don't quite have an explanation for. But in 1959 and 1960, all of these organized winter sports just sort of disappear. Um, there is the final winter frolic is 1959. They don't have it in 1960. It's not back in 1961 or 62. It just kind of stops for a while. Hockey is out of the schools by 1958, 59. The last ski jumping tournament that I can find documented was up in Brokaw in 1960. Again, a junior ski jumping championship, but it's, it's gone after that. Um, the skating speed and figure, those clubs basically stop. They stop meeting. There's, there's, no, there's no organized uh, things happening after that. Um, curling is kind of its own thing. They go off and they're, they're fine. They kind of have their own thing. I, I'm not going to get deep into that story necessarily here. But what, what's really interesting is I don't, we don't really know why. Nobody really talks about it. Um, and it's kind of a chicken the, or the egg situation. Is the winter frolics no longer in existence because the winter sports they, they support are gone? Or are they gone because the winter sport, winter frolic, is not around to support them? Maybe it's a combination. Maybe it's neither or both. I'm not sure. Um, what I do know is that there is a shift in the way that people are engaging in outdoor sports. If you look at the popular sports that emerge in the 50s and 60s, a lot of it is very personal. It's, it's very, you know, this is the sort of thing of like hunting and fishing, right? Ice fishing. Ice fishing is actually featured in the winter frolics in 1958 and 59. Um, not the most interesting spectator sport, I would imagine, though, right? So, I don't know. Um, I think, I think but, but the reason that people go ice fishing is not competitive, which is basically how the Winter Frolic exists. The Winter Frolic is a showcase of com competitions, of the speed skating, who can, who can uh, uh, jump farther on the ski jumps, who can win the most games in hockey. That's kind of at the center of it. Hunting, fish, ice fishing, that's something you go out and you, you know, you get away from, I, I think there are certainly people who pride themselves on being able to catch the most fish, but I think it's mostly about getting away from your life. It's about the camaraderie of sitting in a, in a shack with some friends, you know, enjoying some beverages and listening to the Packer game on the radio or something like that, right? That, that's what ice fishing is. It doesn't quite fit in the same way that it's going to be showcased in a winter's uh, frolic. Um, so yeah, but that's, that's the best that I can answer. I don't really know the, the answer necessarily. And certainly, to be fair, you know, I think what ends up happening is without that adult generation, as people are going off in other directions, you know, for example, the ski jump up in Brokaw here um, gets built in 1939, um, brings back ski jumping in a big way over the course of the 50s. But by the end of the 50s, it's just not enough. We need to keep building a better and bigger uh, ski jump. And there just isn't the community centered around it here. Like there is, for example, in Eau Claire, where they do build a new ski jump, you know, in the 60s. Um, it just doesn't. And so, you know, even though we have like little one here at Hammond Park, and there's a whole other bunch of them that I won't get into. Well, I'll just list a couple briefly. Uh, there's one on Sloan's Hill. Uh, there's one in Parcherville. These are sort of smaller training ones. Uh, there is one actually on Schofield Hill, which is not in Schofield, but confusingly is where the Schofields used to live on the hill behind Tom Field. So there's a bunch of these little ones, right? But we really need, um, in order for the sport to really thrive, you need to have support for the thing. And, and while ice skating and hockey and things like that, you know, come back, um, and ice skating, you know, you really don't need a, a lot of equipment you really need a ski jump in order to ski jump. And so after it comes down in 1966, there just isn't that support for that. So maybe as people go a different direction, for whatever reason, they're not willing to support the organized winter sports. And I should say, people are still skiing and skating and playing hockey and all of these things. It's just not as that organized fashion that there was in the 50s. Um, but we do have the return of the winter frolics in 1979. Um, which is interesting because again, like I said, people are still skating and skiing and, and playing curling and hockey. 
Um, hockey returns to the schools in a new fashion by the end of the 70s. Um, and, and in 1979, or rather 1978, as they're looking at it, they decide it's time to make a return. Um, now, the, the justification, uh, Ray Kurtz, uh, Kurtzhofer uh, was the president of this early group. Uh, he said that it was, it was something, a good opportunity to fight off the winter doldrums. And that was a big part of this, right? Um, to provide a fun activity for the people of Wasta to go out to. You know, it's worth noting, it's that, that goal of becoming the winter playground of Wisconsin had kind of taken, you know, we have Rib Mountain, we have curling, and we have, you know, it's a great place to go for winter sports. Um, and so we ended up take advantage of that. And of course, as part of this too, it's the same reasons that they did it back in the 20s, to promote winter tourism, to get people to come, to put on a fun event for everybody. And that's what they do. But now there's an interesting sort of thing in that they're going back and consciously trying to go and celebrate the... <laughs> the old times. They're going back to the winter frolics of old. And you can see this here in the program um, for the first year, they bring back uh, Mr. Mayer's ski jumping clown. Um, and, and if you flip through it, it's got so like pictures of the frolics from the 20s and 30s. And they're, they're recounting the stories. And they're, they're trying to you know, bring our historical heritage as a way of promoting an event, um, and which is kind of a cool, cool thing. Now, granted, winter uh, um, uh, clowns don't really play as well in 1980 as they did in 1930. So um, in 1980, we do switch to, to this guy instead. Uh, but even then, throughout the 80s, there are attempts to consciously go back and, and build on the traditions of the 30s. In a way, it, or, or not just the 30s, but like the, the past, um, winter frolics in ways that sometimes are accurate and sometimes are not. And a great example of this is the ice castle or ice palace, right? So they, they, as part of the recounting of the stories of old, they remembered, hey, back in 1930, here's this picture of the ice palace. And so they decide in 1981 to build a ice palace of their own. And you can see that they're very consciously, um, or I don't know if you can from this, but they're very consciously building it off of the old picture. Now, you may be wondering why I didn't talk about this earlier, and that's because this actually didn't have very much to do with the winter frolics at all. This was actually Santa's palace, where Santa came uh, in December, and, you know, of course, he's got to find out what his, his friends, the boys and girls of Wassa, want for Christmas. And so, uh, but he's also, you know, used to the cold of North Pole, and so he wouldn't be comfortable staying overnight in a hotel, so we have to build him a nice pa uh, house for him outside in the cold out of ice so that he could be comfortable. Um, at least that was the pretense, right? And, and, you know, by the end of the December, by the time Christmas came around, this wasn't still there. But maybe it doesn't matter. Um, it, it's part of the you know, building on tradition is, you know, you can take inspiration from something. And even if it was, um, you know, true that this is part of the Winter Frolics, they, they find other ways to develop it and they make it into an ice castle and it becomes a new tradition in its own right, which is, is kind of indicative of this. Um, uh, bring back the winter uh, frolic queen, of course. Um, so here's a couple queens. Um, again, it's, it goes back to selling buttons. Um, let's see if I have an example. Yeah, here's 1979, the buttons. Um, and there's a couple different varieties of, of these over the years. There's also a bunch of other events. So just kind of to go through them, some of them they bring back, they have some curl a curling tournament in 1979, they have a hockey game exhibition. Um, they do a whole sort of variant on this, which is not winter sports played in the winter. So we have some golf in the snow. We have uh, softball in the snow, volleyball. Um, we have ice fishing, again, makes a return. Again, I don't know how, how interesting this would have been to, 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 to watch, but maybe to participate, that's, that's cool. Um, they had community events like a gong show, uh, which was published, uh, uh, supported by the, the JCs in 1979. Um, they had um, dances, like the Norwegian dancers came and did a performance. Um, there was new traditions like the, the bearing of an am, uh, the medallion. So the snow medallion would be hidden somewhere on the public land in Marathon County, and then they would give clues every week or every couple days to, to kind of narrow down the search. And the first person that could find it and report it and bring it back to the, the, um, the Chamber of Commerce would get $300. Um, so that was a really fun, long-standing thing. Um, they also tried to make use as best they can of the technology and the, and the, and the changing popular culture around winter sports like uh, snowmobiles. Now they had winter, um, so snowmobiles is an example of something in which they do have comp competitions, right? They have uh, races, but um, that act, it tended to actually be, and they did have some races as part of the frolics, I should say. 
but like they, they found out in 85, it's really expensive um, and it doesn't necessarily bring back the money. But what's maybe, again, similar to like ice fishing, while people do compete in snowmobiling, a lot of what snowmobiling is about is the individual experience of being out in the outdoors, maybe with a, a friend or a family member, or maybe as a group, sort of the communal aspect of it. And so what actually takes, uh, you know, is, is really popular is this, the snowmobile uh, torchlight parade, where they would, you know, have lit torches and they would proceed. Um, I think the route was for most of the time from Bluegill Bay Park um, down to Trails and the Tavern. And so they would light up the river as they went, went past. Um, there's a lot of events. Oop. There's a lot of events um, that they have. Um, maybe too many events. Um, this is from, you know, the, the schedules from 1982 uh, and 84, respectively, left and right here. Um, and even here, I think this is just the big events. They also had a lot of side events. I think, you know, maybe this is me as a historian reading into this a little too much, but I think part of this is they have that, that thing. We have to get it to... Back in the in the 20s and early 30s, this was this big event for the community, and it's got you know we got to build that snow uh, snowball up as quick as possible, and let's just throw whatever any ideas that somebody has, let's just put it in there. So they did have you know some great events that took place, but the winter sports element, I think I think part of it is as they found out in the late 50s, winter sports don't fit in the same showcase like they did in the past. So you can't have speed skating tournaments in the same way. People aren't going to come out to watch that or participate in the same way. And the stuff that they fill this in with sometimes doesn't quite, you know, congeal and, and make for a nice, uh, you know, coherent uh, program. Um, you know, there were, there were years where, you know, just taking the winter sports, um, the curling disappears uh, after after like 1981. I think they stop having a bond spiel or tournament with the frolic. Um, they end up doing things like, um, well, the hockey game, you know, DC Everest is playing Wassa West. So we'll just make that the hockey exhibition of the frolic. And when that kind of worked, there were years where they just did that for the basketball games that were that week or the swim meets or the uh, wrestling tournament. And that maybe kind of dilutes it a little bit. And the stuff that they were filling, you know, there's stuff like, um, you know, there were show, sh belly dancing shows, um, donkey basketball, which is basketball played on donkeys. They had cribbage and bridge tournaments, um, checkers tournaments. They had art shows and literary panels. Uh, the, the author of Real Men Don't Eat Quiche did an appearance at the uh, public library. Um, they had many dances and art shows and fashion shows. And I think what ends up happening is, you know, it very clearly becomes a bit too much for the organizers. Um, and as the novelty of it kind of wears off, because the stuff that they're building the snowball with is kind of falling apart, it's a lot of work to keep this all packed together. And ultimately in 1986, uh, they, the organizers say, we, there's not enough volunteers anymore. It's just a small group of us. We could not get this up and running. So we're going to take 86 off. We're going to be back in 87. It's going to be better and bigger than ever. And they were half right in that. It is back. They rebrand it as uh, Snow Magic, the Snow Magic Festival, which I think is maybe a good idea, um, at least from a historical perspective, that you're not having to contend with this history, um, which maybe helped to get that interest initially, but kind of limited it in, in what it could actually be, in, in maybe in a way. Um, and they return with 26 events instead of the, like the 50, 60 events that they were trying to hit in the, in the early 80s. In 86, there's 26 events over four days. And if you look at the events, you know, they're, they're, they're the stuff that works. It's popular. That people are going to come out to. Um, and this is the case over the course of this. This is going to end in 1992. But over the course of its run for the next couple of years, um, you know, shorter events, events that are going to be targeted and, and be successful and really can be promoted in a big way. And it helps that, that after 1989, they do it in conjunction with the Badger State Winter Games. Um, so they can have this and, 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 and not have to worry about putting on a Nordic or Alpine skiing um, or a, a hockey game or curling competition. They can just have some broom ball, have some snow, uh, 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 so, snow softball and, um, you know, it's just some of the fun stuff, right? Um, because the Badger State game, Winter Games do come to, to Wassa. Wassa is, has that reputation of being one of the, the most, you know, winter playground of Wisconsin. And so we, we do. Um, and to this day, um, it, a lot of the events are held here. It's one of, one of the strengths, um, certainly, of the, of the community um, in, in many ways. Um, yeah. And I will say that even though the, the winter frolic turned snow magic is not a thing anymore, um, for maybe good or bad, you know, I don't think it would, I think you'd struggle to have the same sort of thing, especially now that we have the Badger State Winter Games. I think you would struggle to have 
that sort of competition, you know, be here today. Um, but even the snow magic, you know, the way that they found to succeed and go forward, um, you know, they may, maybe gave up on the, on some of the aspect, like the, the crowning of a snow queen uh, for magic queen and things like that um, as time went on. But a lot of the DNA of that festival and what worked in the early nineties, uh, late eighties, early nineties continues to pop up here and there in other events. Um, so yeah. And, and over, over the, the course of this, I think, you know, the, the stuff that you can, you can pull out of this is, you know, if it wasn't for the winter, uh, the, the Wassa winter frolics, you know, we, that laid the groundwork. It, it was successful in a lot of things and putting Wassa on the map, making us a destination for winter tourism um, and all of that. And, and, and certainly was a, a very great and successful event uh, for the community. Um, and I think that that is its legacy. And I think, I think that's where I'm going to call it. I, I never know quite how to end these, but I think that that is, is the ending that we're going to go with. Um, thanks for watching.